Welcome back to Fixed Income in 15. Today I'm talking to David Hunt, CEO at PGM and Maria Melendez, Global Head of Strategy at S&P Global Ratings. Today we're talking strategy, how to grow an asset management business and the future of the financial industry. So a quick reminder that the views of the external guests are their views alone and they do not represent the views of S&P Global Ratings. Okay, great. Let's kick off. David, would you be able to give us an overview of your career thus far, going into how your prior experience is informing your current role as president and CEO at PGIM? Sure, and greetings to everyone. And Joe, it's great to uh, be with you today. Um, I think the most important thing about my background uh, is that it was spent outside the United States. So I uh, started out fairly early on. I lived in both Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, I lived in Tokyo for uh, a bit in my 20s. Um, I still remember traveling all through uh, China back before many of the roads were paved and they used to have the big black Russian built uh, limousines for all the government officials. And now when you arrive obviously in Shanghai, you have quite a different, uh, different view. Um, in my, uh, my 30s, I worked in Europe uh, pretty extensively. I worked in Paris for a while. I worked in the UK. Um, before moving back uh, to the U.S. where I was brought up um, in, uh, in the 2000s. Um, I spent 22 years at uh, McKinsey & Company, the management consulting firm. Uh, I ran the securities practice, I ran the asset management practice, and then in 2011, I left uh, McKinsey to join PGIM, uh, the global investment management business uh, of, of Prudential. So I think that uh, a lot of my comments today will be about globalizing the business and building out in new markets. And I do think because I have spent a lot of my life living in many of those markets is something that I have a lot of a lot of passion about. Great stuff. So Maria, could you let us know what you're doing at S&P Global Ratings, what you define as strategy and what that means for you on a day to day basis? Sure, Joe. So uh, I lead the strategy team for S&P Global Ratings, and I facilitate the end-to-end -end strategy process for the division. So that includes looking at things like marketing, competitive intelligence, um, mar partnerships and M&A, strategy formulation, analytics and performance measurement, and working with colleagues in risk on the assessment of strategic risk. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, what is strategy, how I define it, you know, to me, my basic definition is a strategy is a set of choices that you have to make um, in order to achieve your goals. And so for simplicity, I generally think about that in two categories. One is the business strategy and the other is organizational strategy. And it's very, very critical that these two things be in alignment. Um, so starting with business strategy, you know, that's what you typically expect um, to hear a strategy. So what markets and customer segments you serve, what products, your position in the market, uh, et cetera. The organizational strategy is how you organize the resources of the company to best deliver on these products and services. What capabilities need to be built? How do you maintain them? How do you really achieve and sustain competitive advantage uh, in terms of what you're doing? And so. What that means is for me, uh, sort of in charge of both sides of it um, and helping to facilitate that for ratings is that my day to day is very varied. Um, like many of us, I spent most of my day in meetings, but um, you know, one day I may be looking at you know, externally how markets are evolving, uh, looking at the future, um, how it may be impacted by things like decentralized finance. Um, the next meeting, I'd be looking to understand how we can align on objectives and priorities um, to deliver on our strategy and what sort of technology capabilities we may need to, to build and align on. And then maybe brainstorming how we communicate strategy to employees to make sure there is that excitement within the organization. So in short, I would say every day is different um, and that's what makes it uh, very interesting and exciting. Great, great stuff. So David, what's your current take on the global macro environment, including what you see as maybe the main concerns, threats, and also opportunities? Well, Joe, it's an absolutely fascinating time, both in the economy and in, in the markets. I mean, the first thing I would say is that, uh, you know, it's remarkable just the diversity that we have now around the globe. In many years after uh, the great financial crisis, actually most countries were in kind of a slow growth, low inflation, low rate uh, environment, and then to different degrees, but the contours were largely the same. 
we now find ourselves very differently. We find uh, places like China are rapidly slowing, um, but so far have not really had the kind of inflation bite that other places have. Japan, really no inflation to speak of, but still extremely uh, low growth. Europe has had an enormous spike in, in inflation, largely driven uh, by, by energy prices and by food. Um, and we really there have seen uh, a, a real sharp uptick in, uh, in rates. And then in the U.S., I would say that we've had certainly a higher inflation and more broad-based inflation, actually, than, than, than Europe. And we have a central bank that has absolutely made it clear that they intend to continue to raise rates until they bring inflation down. So a very different landscape uh, ar around the world. Personally, I believe that we're headed into a very new regime um, and that this will not look like the kind of uh, post-GFC uh, regime in, in the slightest. We will have continued much more variability by country. We will have higher inflation um, that does not simply drop down to the 2%. And we will have slightly higher rates, although by historical standards, they'll still probably be uh, pretty low. And unfortunately, I think we are going to go back to a somewhat low productivity, low growth uh, in the real economy uh, world for most of the developed, uh, the developed world. I hope that's uh, too, too, too gloomy, but I actually think that is a reasonable starting point for this. So what all that means is that um, you know, we, we kind of know what the two or three year picture looks like, but it's probably going to be a pretty volatile and bumpy road as we get to that, because central banks are going to continue to tighten so long as inflation uh, continues to stay very elevated. And that's going to lead to significant financial stresses and to uh, volatility in, in the markets. Great. Thanks, David. So, Maria, let's just say you've just joined a, a company. On day one, what are some of the frameworks you're using to help you assess the, the long term strategic direction of an organization? Yeah, so, so I think, you know, really when I join a new company, um, there's a couple things that I like to do. One is I think it's important to talk to people um, to understand uh, two things. One is what is the company's uh, strategic areas of focus? You know, we talked about what markets they serve. Are they in growing markets, mature markets, et cetera? And also what is the, um, the sense within the organization of the opportunities? Um, I also like to understand the maturity of an organization's strategy process. And what I mean by that is how does the organization do strategy um, and where is there room for improvement? Um, you know, again, I think it's important to uh, align on, um, you know, as a strategist coming and leading that process, really understanding where I can make a difference uh, in the organization. Um, so I want to maybe by that, you know, talk a little bit about, about an example. Um, I remember once starting uh, with an organization asking to see their strategy document and getting an Excel file of 200 plus uh, strategic initiatives. Um, another organization I joined, um, you know, I asked, what are your strategic initiatives? And I was said, well, I'm not sure how to uh, define that. Um, there was no like clear list. And so again, I think in both of these, it was clear that there was a lack of alignment on what the strategic priorities were for the organization. So to me, that is, you know, the first thing I do is really try to understand what those are, is their alignment, um, and really understanding how we can uh, drive that alignment going forward. Um, you know, that kind of experience is very typical in an organization. Um, a lot of organizations formulate strategy through a bottom-up process, um, sort of cascading up priorities and action plans. And so it's really, it's important to uh, was sitting at the top to think about how to shift that process. Um, and so how one would do that, I think might be interesting. Um, so when it comes to shaping uh, the medium to long-term direction um, and maturing the strategy discipline, I like to really think about three things. And I, you know, I, I try to keep things simple. Uh, strategies, it's not, it's not that complicated. It's not brain surgery, as I always say. Um, so I ask three questions. One is, you know, looking uh, externally, what could markets look like in, let's say, five to ten years, right? I think uh, some more organizations make the mistake of saying, you know, what are my pain points now and how do I fix them? But um, that's very important from an operational strategy perspective. But more broadly, I think it's important to understand where things are going in the future and, you know, set yourself up to achieve that. Um, 
So once you have a good sense of where markets are going, uh, understanding what does winning look like for the organization in that future? What are some alternatives um, and actually choose a path to go down? And then lastly, you know, I mentioned earlier organizational strategy. So to me, it's very important to understand what are the business and enterprise capabilities that you need to invest in today to be successful um, and making deliberate decisions around what those are, what timeframes you want to achieve those, uh, and also what constraints you're under, real or perceived. Um, and that's I want to make a point on that last one as well. Um, I think sometimes the real constraint and the perceived constraints might be different and there may be more, more perceived constraints than real constraints. And so I think it's important to, to make sure those are well understood and you know, really what is the organization's room for maneuver. Great. Thanks, Maria. David, can you talk to us a bit about your view of private market investing? So is it an area that PGM are looking at closely now and if so, why? So PGM is uh, the world's 10th largest asset manager. We have about $1.3 trillion in, in assets, and those are actually quite nicely balanced across uh, the major kinds of, of asset classes, fixed income, equity, real estate, private credit. Um, and they're also nicely balanced across client groups. So we have uh, our, our, our dominant client group is probably institutional uh, investors, but we have probably about a third of our uh, businesses with retail investors as well. And I, I offer that just as context because um, actually our private markets capabilities are about 250 billion. Um, most of that is real estate. We're the third largest real estate uh, investor in the world. And, and we're also one of the largest private credit investors with over a hundred billion um, in assets under, under management. And this whole area within private uh, alternatives has been one of the fastest growing for us. And one of the reasons for that is actually that the entire economy is changing how uh, it actually finances itself. So if you go back 20 years, you would find that for the most part, it was the banks who did project finance, middle market lending, infrastructure. It was the consumer finance companies that did aircraft and other kinds of, of leasing. You know, banks uh, after the GFC and because of a lot of the new capital regimes that were put in place have really pulled back from many of these uh, many of these areas. And we don't really have any of the consumer finance uh, uh, businesses that are, are, are left at scale. And so into that void has stepped institutional investors in, in uh, the form of uh, large, mostly private funds, uh, private credit. And that, so that's been a very large uh, area of growth for the industry and for us. And we actually think it's now really important because private capital and both LP and GP capital is playing a much more important role in fueling and funding the growth of the economy than it ever did before. And it's much less dependent on, on, on the banks, which I think in general is a positive uh, scenario. Great. So David, you joined PGM as CEO in 2011 when their AOM was around the half a trillion mark. So now in 2022, the AUM stands at kind of 1.2-ish trillion dollars. So more than doubled uh, in that time period. So speaking on behalf of any other asset management CEO watching or listening, what strategies have you used to grow the business so quickly? Well, one thing I would say is that um, you know a AUM levels are a lagging indicator of success rather than a leading one, and I always caution leaders not to focus too much on uh, AUM. For one thing, uh, AUM can actually be the enemy of investment performance, and so uh, in many ways it's not so clear to me that your clients are better off just because you are larger, and I'll come back to the role of scale in a, in a moment. but. I think that the most important thing uh, in, in the investment managed industry um, really can be boiled down to two major themes for a CEO. One is outstanding long-term investment performance, and the other is a really strong culture and talent machine that really attracts uh, the best and the brightest. And if you can get both of those things going well, 
then all the rest of the world will take care of itself. Flows will take care of themselves, growth will take care of themselves, and you will have a robust business. So I always encourage people to focus on the leading indicators. And for me, that's why I start my morning, uh, in addition to breakfast, with you know my excess return chart. I want to know how are we doing, and I follow that religiously, and I care a lot about the attribution of why we're good, why we're bad, why we're wrong, and what we can learn from that. And secondly, I care desperately about our people. I care about our culture. I care that we have a culture of meritocracy and inclusion, and one where we're getting the very best ideas out of all of, uh, all of our folks. And if I can get that focus on those two things, all good things will happen to earnings and growth. Great, very interesting, thanks David. So Maria, you spent over 15 years in senior positions covering the world of strategy. So whether you're a CEO like David or you used to work on Windows 1 of the McDonald's drive through like me, you, you need to have a strategy to be successful in your role. So how can everyone watching or listening incorporate strategy into their day-to-day -day role in the most efficient way? Yeah, so I think for me, the, the number one piece of advice I would give is to be very clear on your goals, on what you're actually trying to accomplish, what is the problem you're trying to solve. I think, you know, in my experience, people sometimes talk about, start strategizing or talk about solutions before they've really defined the problem. Um, and I think once you've defined the problem, I would say make the investment to talk to other people to see how they see the problem. I think it's important to bring in that diversity of views and you might find that the problem you thought you were trying to solve um, is not actually the problem that other people think needs to be solved. Uh, so I would say, you know, in the day to day, it's very easy to, you know, grab onto an idea and, and jump into action. I think, you know, in the long term, it's I think it's more efficient to make that investment up front to really um, understand and dive deep into what is the actual problem you want to solve, the outcome you want to create, and getting alignment around that, um, I think will pay dividends in the end. So as my first uh, manager used to say, it's really around speed, not haste. So don't be too hasty in driving forward uh, with uh, what you're trying to do, but just make sure that um, you've considered the angles. Yeah, I think, Joe, I think that's a really important point, and just maybe to build build on that. I think that uh, one of the things about being an active manager is that you need to have a culture that supports non-consensus views and does that for a long period of time, right? If, 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 if all we wanted to do is have money managers who basically believed in the consensus, then we could just all buy the index and go home. We, we get paid for having views that are not in the price and then holding with that, sometimes for years, by the way, um, until uh, they become uh, right or until we finally give up. But, but having a culture that is actually supportive of people being different from everybody else and having the courage of their convictions and knowing they'll be supported for that is very, very unique. I mean, most large companies actually operate on the other process, which is it's kind of a hierarchy and people kind of get ground down until there's kind of a, a vague consensus at the top. And in order for, for our culture to work, the exact opposite has to be true. We have to have people that have different points of view and that are different than the markets, and they need to have confidence in that. And that's a really special, I think, sauce to at least our culture and I think all uh, very good active managers. Absolutely, thank you both. So David, we've seen a lot of consolidation in the asset management industry over the past kind of five years. What do you think the future could look like and what, in your view, could be the largest disruptive threats to the industry? So I think consolidation is always a, a difficult term. I mean, at the beginning of every, uh, every year, all the investment bankers come out and say there's going to be yet another wave of consolidation and M&A. And unfortunately, it never actually happens uh, that way. The, the industry has consolidated a little bit, by which I mean uh, the top 20 players have a larger market share than they did uh, 10 years ago. But it's by no means a heavily consolidated industry at all. And in fact, uh, it remains, I think, very active at the small end that there are many, many small boutique investment firms that have individual strategies who are doing uh, quite well indeed. Uh, thank you very much. So it does not look like the car industry, the steel industry, pick, pick your favorite. Um, 
But that said, there is clearly a separation of winners and losers that are happening uh, within the industry and, and certainly in, the, in the, the top end. And the reason for that is actually client needs. So clients are consolidating the number of asset managers that they want to do business with. They might have done business with 200 uh, five years ago. They now are bringing that down to 100. Um, and they want to go further. They, they believe that they, they are going to be best served by actually working with fewer players, but doing more with them um, so that they really get the very best performance and they get the kind of risk management uh, that they get with uh, a, a truly global player. So a lot of the consolidation you're seeing here is being driven by the desire of clients to do, you know, fewer firms, but to do more things and more strategies with those fewer firms. And I think that trend will actually continue and you will continue to see the separation of winners and losers in the industry. But we're a long way, as I said, from what you would truly say is a consolidated industry. And I'm not sure we'll ever get there. Fantastic. And what about kind of disruptive threats? Did you have any kind of thoughts on that? Well, without a doubt, the uh, most disruptive threat uh, over the last decade to active managers has been passive. Um, and I think we've seen most of that in the public equities uh, business, but it's also increasingly coming to fixed income. And I think that it's posed a very important challenge to active managers that, hey, if you can't really beat your benchmark after fees, uh, we have a better way of investing for this. And I personally think that that's a very fair challenge. I think that active is actually going to continue to grow even from here. And I think what it's done is to force good active managers to take more tracking error, to take more risk, um, and to prove that they over the long term can really demonstrably after fees uh, beat, their, beat their benchmark. And I think that investors have been well served by that competition and we welcome it. Great, thanks David. So Maria, which individuals from the world of strategy do you look to for inspiration or guidance? And that could be people very well known in the public eye or personal mentors. Yeah, so for me, you know, I do I do enjoy reading a lot and, um, you know, getting perspectives from different disciplines. I wouldn't say that I'm um, loyal to one strategist. I really get my inspiration mostly from people I work with every day, um, whether it could be my manager, peers inside the organization. Um, and also peers in other organizations doing similar work. Um, so, for example, I think that, um, you know, I used to be part of this group of strategists who would get together once a year to sort of commiserate around the challenges we had in our organization, sort of working with the business. And, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of organizations have very similar um, uh, challenges in terms of execution or, or being strategic or really seizing opportunities that everyone agrees exist. And so really being able to bounce ideas off of peers, looking at best practices and sharing those, what works, what doesn't work, I think that's critical. So, you know, one piece of advice I would say is, you know, definitely build that network um, of, of peers um, that you can speak to. Uh, the other thing is to look outside the own, your own discipline. I think that strategy can sometimes be, you know, it seems very glamorous and there are all these frameworks and tools and and, you know, there's a lot we can learn from other disciplines as well. And so one of the things, you know, over my probably over the past, you know, seven to 10 years, um, really understanding the intersection between strategy and change. Uh, whenever you're implementing a new strategy, you're really driving change in an organization. And so understanding change management and that organizational um, uh, psychology, in a sense, um, you know, how quickly you can move an organization, all of that. It's really fascinating. I am by no means an expert, um, but I think that some, it's definitely worth, um, you know, getting to know the people that are uh, and having them help you. Great. Fantastic. David, tell us what excites you right now about the asset management industry. What do you think is some of the most interesting developments that are taking place today? Well, Joe, I think it's an absolutely fascinating time to be an active investor. Uh, I mean, goodness, we have uh, incredible uh, transition in, uh, in, in the economies around the world. We have big questions around globalization and whether that will go forward, backward or look uh, somewhat different. 
Um, we have enormous changes in technology, which is disrupting supply chains around, uh, around the world. And then we have big macro enforcers like uh, what in the world is going to happen with, with inflation uh, and, and energy. And, and so I think that um, you know, our, our jobs at the end of the day is to allocate capital efficiently to new opportunities. And that's actually right now very difficult to work out. And I think that's a challenge that active managers really relish. I think most of us feel that the money we put out over the next 24 months may in fact be some of the best returning money that we've put out in a while. Because remember, we're now going to be moving back into markets that relative to three or four years ago are just a much better entry point. And so while you know our portfolios may have taken a, a bit of a hit uh, as we've kind of gone through this rate rise, looking forward, you know, for a couple of years, you know, rates are too high, spreads are too wide, and I think this is going to be actually an extremely good time to be an active manager over the next 24 months, and that's a very exciting place to be. Yeah, very interesting. So, Maria, prior to S&P, you spent seven years at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York working on strategy. So what were you doing there on a day-to-day -day basis? How did you find the experience working at the largest and arguably the most influential of the reserve banks. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is such a storied institution. It was truly a privilege to work there. Um, so I was hired into their newly formed strategic planning office. I was asked to take on the build and leading of the strategic planning and evaluation function for the organization. And so Again, that was around end-to-end -end strategic planning from sort of external environmental uh, scanning, setting objectives, supporting the execution, sort of planning execution, monitoring performance, and really understanding based on that performance, how can we improve, how can we um, get better at planning and improve our performance. Um, and so that, um, you know, that was really fascinating. And I've done a lot of um, a lot of roles in my career where I was in sort of a startup mode within a larger organization. Um, and so I do really like building new things and implementing um, a sort of capabilities inside an organization. And that was really, you know, truly fascinating. Um, how did I, um, you know, how do I find the experience? It was, it was just, you know, it was really amazing. Uh, there were super smart people, such a strong sense of mission and public service. Um, I was truly humbled. I think being in a room with a, you know, a bunch of PhD economists, and I felt very undereducated, even though I'm actually well educated. Um, but it was, you know, I'm really grateful for that experience. Um, I still keep in touch with some of my former colleagues. It's a great organization, um, and so just um, I learned a lot uh, there, and yeah, just truly a you know privilege to have been there. Fantastic. David, you mentioned previously, you were at McKinsey for around 20, 22 years, and you were responsible for being a key advisor to leading financial executives across the world. Can you tell us a bit about some of the biggest and some of the most impressive personalities you met along the way? So I, this has absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with, with McKinsey, but I think that um, in truth, we've lived through some of the most fascinating times um, from an economic uh, perspective and from an investment perspective over the last 15 years. And I think as you, as you, uh, hopefully all of us, try to learn from the past and recognizing that the future will not repeat itself in the same way. But we have some people who really work through uh, the GFC in a very fundamental way. And I think listening to them and understanding their version of both what happened then and what could go wrong in the future is incredibly uh, important. I mean, just think of the perspectives of somebody like Mario Draghi um, and what he can actually impart to all of us, uh, both from his perspectives uh, as the ECB, but also obviously more uh, recently in, in, in Italy. Think about, uh, Marie, you mentioned the, the Federal, think about Tim Geithner. Um, think about uh, Ben Bernanke. I mean, these are, these are amazing public servants who served uh, through some of the most difficult times uh, that our country has seen. And they have a lot, I think, to teach us um, as we think now, oh boy, are we going to have a period of volatility and what might break going forward? And I think those are the kinds of names and voices that uh, we should tap into as we, uh, as we try to work out uh, the, the way forward. Absolutely. 
So David, the last question goes to you. So on this podcast, Fixed Income in 15, I usually interview leaders and influential individuals from the world of finance and beyond, really. So who would you recommend that I ask to be a guest on a future episode of the show? So I'd pick from my previous list. I, if, if, I, if I were you, I would try to get uh, Draghi. I, I, I think that uh, somebody who's sat in the multiple seats that he has over the last 15 years and the perspective that he has also from, from uh, as a European is just incredibly valuable. And I think your, uh, your viewers and readers would really, really benefit from, uh, from his perspectives now that he uh, doesn't hold public office anymore. Fantastic, great stuff. Thank you so much to David and Maria. Fascinating discussion. For everyone watching and listening, see you next time on Fixed Income in 15.